is it it good morning and welcome to our sunday morning service here at wesley's chapel our friends who are sitting or standing upstairs on the balcony are the nebraska ambassadors of music and all others from the state of nebraska it is so nice to have you with us this morning. We bid you a very warm welcome to London and to Wesley Chapel. I've heard that you're going to travel through many, many countries in Europe for the next two weeks. You'll be singing and holding concerts in France, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, uh, uh, Liechtenstein Austria, Italy, and Germany. It is a great mystery to me how you're going to cover all these countries in two weeks. I'm sure you'll be very busy traveling. But how special it is to know that Wesley's Chapel is your first place that you're singing on your trip. We wish your time in London and with us here at the chapel will be as memorable as all the other places that you're going to, singing, to be singing on your trip. Um, we have other people from many other places, both near and far. Um, our Sunday morning services are live streamed on our website as well as on our YouTube channel. Uh, we welcome everyone worshipping with us in this service, those of you actually in the pews, as well as those present virtually via the internet. Now we're going to invite our friend from Nebraska to sing the opening intro. Praise his holy name. When the intro is over, without any further announcement, we'll be singing our first hymn. So please have it ready. Hymn number 11, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
So we come to time of prayer. Time to say thank you and time to say sorry. And we're going to conclude this time of prayer with Psalm 8, which can be found in our hymn book at 801. So if you please have the psalm open and ready now, we will say it all together at the end of our prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for calling us to this place of worship this morning. We are here together to worship, to sing your praises, to pray for our, ourselves and others, to listen and learn from your words, and also to love and to be loved through our fellowship with others. God, you are the living God. So come, come and fill this worship with your presence. Bless us with your spirit and quieten our minds and our hearts and make yourselves be the focus of our worship. God of grace and truth, you know each and every one of us, and there's nothing hidden from you. So, Lord, in prayer, we bring all our feelings and thoughts. We bring our joys and sorrows, our hopes and fears. We bring our memories from the past as well as our plans and dreams for the future. Lord, we praise you and give you thanks for your unfailing love and your faithfulness in loving us and accepting us just as we are. God of compassion, you call us to learn from you to love others in the same way that you have loved us. You are calling us. You are calling your church to build a caring community. Compared to what you have given us in our life, Lord, we confess that many times we fail to respond to your calling. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for the times when we fail to listen. Forgive us when we take all the blessings and the gifts in life for granted. Forgive us when we place ourselves before you and others. Lord, we are sorry for all our sins all our failures in loving you and our neighbors. Lord, we turn away from all our sins and we ask for your mercy and for your help. Gracious God, your goodness never fails us. Your grace frees us from our sins, and you help us to become the true followers of Jesus Christ and his love. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Savior. Amen. We say the Psalm 8 together. Let's say that together. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
you have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your force to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the flesh of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. A choir from Nebraska will now sing the second song, Amazing Grace.
This is the time in our service when our children and young people go to their own activities. Please note that the junior church is gathering in the Radna Hall next door, and the youth group will be in the Philadelphia room downstairs. And we wish them well and send them off with our blessings. In a moment, Joy Leach and Zina Ghos will come forward and read our first and the second lessons. which is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 to 13. Final greetings and benediction. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order, then listen to my appeal. Agree with one another and live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. This is the word of the Lord. Listen for the word of the Lord as it is recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. The commissioning of the disciples. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember... I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. It's uh, nice to have arrived in time. I've been preaching at the parish church at their 10 o'clock Eucharist, and it was the last visit I shall make there. And so there were some valedictory ceremonials that I needed to be part of since the goodbye was to me. Uh, apart from that, there was a long-winded preacher, and it did mean that uh, I left a little later than I usually do, 
when I preached down there at St. Giles. I did catch sight of a few of these eager faces from Nebraska before I left, but they were all a bit at sixes and sevens because they'd arrived so early, and apart from the choir, they didn't quite know what to do with themselves. I think the local coffee shops enjoyed their custom. They went for a little walk. It's nice to see you all from Nebraska. We have very close friendships with Nebraska, especially from the pastor and his staff at the First United Methodist Church in Lincoln. And indeed, they'll be here next week. And uh, I'm rather sorry that they haven't come on the same week as you're here. So, you just remind me, you're the John the Baptist collectively for my friend who's coming next week. Lovely to see you all, and I hope that your stay and your travels are fruitful. So here we are on Trinity Sunday. Now, I've already reported, and quite recently, the conversation I had with a Jewish friend of ours when she came a few weeks ago, about a month ago, to stay with us. We've been seeing each other for a very long time. Fran Reiter. I make no apologies for repeating and just a little enlarging the conversation that uh, she engaged in with us at that time. When I met Fran Reiter in 1993, I think it was, she was the deputy mayor of New York, and she was the uh, deputy to Rudy Giuliani. Indeed, she ran his re-election campaign. She and I, uh, because I've got to know Rudy Giuliani myself in the interim, uh, shrink with horror at some of the conversations that Mr. Giuliani's been having with the present incumbent at the White House. But we'll say no more about that, I promise you, because I would want us to be polite, deferential, and all the other proper things with our visitors from America. But Fran Reiter was in conversation with us when she'd had, now I'm leaving soon so I can just say it like it was instead of all the polite stuff I've had to do for 21 years. <laughs> she'd had two glasses of whiskey and was on her third. <laughs> and she said, I haven't any time for religion, she said. No more. Uh, I'm a Jew. I'm a secular Jew. I have faith. I believe in God, but religion screws me up. Now, let me tell you, you lovely Americans, that screwing someone up is not a phrase that we're accustomed to using. <laughs> you have introduced us to that. Religion is about the way faith is organized, and she has no time for that. And then she added, I think she said that Christianity is the most to be criticized. It ought to be the game changer. We Jews are weighed down with our rules and regulations. We have a noble history. We have a strong sense of community. But on the whole, our religion is just for us. Christianity offers something to everybody. And then she went on and said, Islam is also weighed down by its own contradictions. Again, a noble history, pure doctrine, but unresolved inner con conflict. Uh, she suggested that we Christians have resolved all of our conflicts, which I thought was a compliment we didn't always deserve. Christianity, she was sure, had fought through its contradictions, had grown old and wise from the buffetings of history. And she said, the reason I make that claim for Christianity is that it's gathered round such a simple formula. Love God, love your neighbor. That is it. And if we could all only do that, the world would be a better place. Now, the astute amongst you and those with sight lines that permit it will see that the two boards behind us here, on the right and on the left, Repeat that formula, thou shalt love God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength, says that one, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, on that one. 
Well, she thought that that was the formula that could do it for everybody if only we could apply it. Love God, love your neighbor. And she went on, such an attractive teacher, a lovely Jewish boy. But Christianity, she went on and repeated, has blown it, made it too complicated. Too complicated. Well, was she right? That's the question I come with this morning on Trinity Sunday. Trinity is the perfect day to ask that question. This is the day when we try to the outsider bravely to explain that while you might have thought that three equals three, we have found a way, we Christians, of making three equal one. Instead of one plus one plus one coming to the grand total of three, instead we do something like three divided by three equals one. Hey, presto. Now, we call it mathematics in Britain. You call it math <laughs> in the United States. But although you've got it wrong, <laughs> despite the fact that you call it that and we call it this, you'll agree with me that one plus one plus one cannot equal anything other than three. At the heart of the conundrum that faces us and that is focused on Trinity Sunday is the difficulty in defining the nature of Christ. How could Christ be fully human and fully man? And I promise you that the best brains in the world across the centuries have applied themselves to answering that question. In the Nicene Creed, which is the official sort of grand creedal statement of Christianity, when we come to believing in Jesus Christ, we have the following qualifications. Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. Now, that appears in every one of the ten orders of communion in our Methodist service book. That's the creed. Now, the astute and the regulars here will know that in my 21 years as the minister of this chapel, I've never used it, not once. What's more, not one single person has noticed. Nobody's asked me, hey, where's the Nicene Creed? No one seems to have missed it at all. I believe it's because it, no longer, it is no longer fit for purpose, it rings no bells. It's part of our archive. You see, I'm beginning to feel demob happy. And if I'm drummed out of the Methodist Church now as a heretic to beat all heretics, then I don't care a fig. I believe that if I gave each one of the people here a piece of paper and a pencil now and 15 minutes to write on it and ask you to explain the explanation for the full humanity and the full divinity of Christ as laid down in the creed, you wouldn't have a chance. Or at least, if there are 300 or 400 of you here, we'd have as many explanations, except that knowing some of my own members, we'd have even more explanations than there are people. <laughs> and if you think the Nicene Creed raises the problem in a sharp way, let me introduce you to the Athanasian Creed. It's in the Book of Common Prayer. It's to be said about once a month throughout the Christian year. And well, if this were a party and we were up to our merry old tricks and every one of us had to do a party turn, I would read the Athanasian Creed for you from start to finish. And by the time I finished, you'd be rolling in the aisles, tickled to death. I'll only just give you a flavor now. It talks about the Father incomprehensible, 
before going on to talk about the sun, incomprehensible, and then finishing with the spirit, incomprehensible. And before you jump to any conclusions, it jumps in with a qualifying remark. There are not three incomprehensibilities, only one incomprehensibility, and I say the whole thing's incomprehensible to me. To have to go to that extent to try and define what at the end of the day is a mystery. Now let me tell you, I have a lot of respect for the Nicene Creed. It was a noble attempt to solve a real intellectual question in its day. It was formulated, or the formulation began, it was developed a little later in the year 325 Nicene, but in the end it became, as we've got it now, well, I was going to say 451 at the Council of Chalcedon, but actually in the Western Church, that's our lot, we added two words in Latin, remember it was a Greek creed, two words in Latin that caused, or at least was the straw that broke the camel's back, the division of Western and Eastern Christianity. Two words to the creed, what were they? Filioque, well, it's one word really in Latin, and proceeds from the Son and from the Father. The Spirit is supposed to, and those little words were enough to drive a wedge between Western and Eastern Christianity. Now, how would you do it? Just ask yourself for a moment. Throw yourself back in time. Go into the TARDIS with Doctor Who and come out on the other side in the fourth century with me for a minute. You've got a Semitic message. Something exploded intellectually in a Hebraic, Aramaic context. Jesus, a Jew. His disciples, Jews. His teaching in Aramaic. And you have all of that suddenly, as they say now, going viral. Out it leapt from the Hebraic, Aramaic world into what we now call the Hellenic world. The world where trade and commerce and culture were in the Greek language. And so, you have to imagine a Semitic original translated into a Hellenic world. You see, it's difficult. I do a bit of translation, and I know how difficult it is to translate from one language into another and get it all right. Why even between America and Britain? We can't translate our different versions of English so that we understand each other. I mean, when a man, a grown man, a good-looking man, a man with a nice suit on comes up to me and holds out his hand and says, Hi, I'm Randy. <laughs> I promise you, I promise you it causes me to shudder. <laughs> and when on television I see that the captain, for the very first time, the British and Irish Lions rugby team in New Zealand for the first time, the Lions have as their captain a hooker. Well, we know what it means, but they haven't got a clue. You see, we are divided by a common language. Well, imagine then the difficulties that will arise between a Semitic original and a Hellenic world into which it has to be translated. Not only that, but around that Hellenic world, there were centers of intellectual excellence, each beavering away at answering the question I started with. How can Jesus be both man and God at the same time? In Alexandria, in Egypt, in Jerusalem, but in Antioch, Ephesus, in Chalcedon, in Rome, why well, they were all beavering away at the same question, and every now and then coming together for a conference to talk about what they had discovered. In those days, in the fourth century, you young people won't have a clue about this, but in those days, the internet had not yet been invented. And so they couldn't be passing emails to each other just to see where they were going with their discussion. They came with pre-prepared statements that had the endorsement of their councils of churches and the rest of it, and plonk them on the table expecting their view to prevail. You can imagine what a formula that was for good and adequate discussion. In the end, the Greeks started talking about shades of meaning that were difficult for everybody to comprehend. It looked as if the conversation would go on forever, 
And in the end, it all came to pass because the Pope in Rome, Pope Leo I, sent a bunch of heavies over to Ephesus and told them, you'll sort this out one way or the other, but I prefer it the one way that's our way. Because the empire, the Roman Empire, was beginning to be under great pressure. And he wanted a political fix, a political fix, to unify the empire as it stood and to rescue his empire from the threat of division. So the creed that we've got carries all of this history. Not only that, more people were excluded from Christianity by the creed than included in it. The Copts and the Nestorians and the Eusebians, and I could go on and on and tell you about them, but they were outside the arrangement. Do you know, whenever I think about the debates that led to the Nicene Creed, I think it sounds more and more like the European Union every moment, that the Greeks especially are a little bit problematical. Well, the question, let's remind ourselves, was, what do we do about this claim that Jesus is both fully human and fully divine? How do we get a formula that does that? Shouldn't we keep to the Scripture what the Scripture tells us about the nature of Christ in order to find the perfect solution? Well, of course you should. Bible's everything. Except they couldn't pull it off. And in the end, they settled for a word, I'll give you the word in Greek, homoousios, which is they were these two natures of a similar, indeed, of an identical nature. They invented a word to solve the problem. That's the creed we've got. I have problems with creeds, not because I want a philosophy of anything goes. I have problems with creeds that purport to pin God down to a formula. God cannot be pinned down to a formula. The cleverest people in the world, meeting in the most favorable circumstances and coming forth with the largest degree of unity, will never pin down God, who will always be more mysterious than their explanations, vaster than the span to which they reduce Him, and always challenging our nostrums and our results. God cannot be pinned down. I remember my dear old friend Donald Soper. Again, young Americans, that will not mean a thing to you. But he was one of the great uh, preachers of our day, of my day. I'm ancient, long time before you were born. And one of the places he used to really go out and take on the world, Sopa Contra Mundum, was Hyde Park Speaker's Corner. He would speak in a marketplace of ideas, and people would heckle him and shout at him and be rude to him, and he had the presence to engage in discussion, even with his critics. I wish a bit more Christian interface of that kind were available to us, instead of just um, a Christian evangelical television channel. Get out there in the sticks where the wind's blowing and where people have their worries and their questions. That's where you have to put your case, not comfortably, before like-minded people. Anyway, they asked Donald Soper in one of those moments, Dr. Soper, how do you explain the divinity of Christ? Now, Donald knew that was a catch question, so he gave his kind of answer. He said, my boy, he said, disarming when he said that, he always used to address me as my boy. My boy, he said, I look to the humanity of Jesus, and I believe the divinity can look after itself. A perfect answer. A perfect answer because whilst we do our best guessing and we try to get as near as we can, we have humbly to admit that we will never pin down a doctrine of God that does everything that needs to happen to define, restrict the nature of God. Well, that leads me to my, sub, my, my consequent question, 
If the creeds won't do it on Trinity Sunday, what will? Love God, it says. Love your neighbor. Well, regulars know that I'm getting more and more irked by those two boards, not because they don't believe in them, but because they don't say quite everything. When Jesus answered the lawyer, he didn't say, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God and thy neighbor as thyself. He started with seven other words. The Lord thy God is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy strength and all thy mind and all thy might and thy neighbor as thyself. And I'm increasingly wanting the doctrine of God as lived out by Christians to make it clear to the world at large that we are not tritheistic, polytheistic, non-monotheistic believers. We believe in one God, and we have seen as much of that God as we human beings can bear in the person of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament makes it clear nobody can look on God and live. I believe there's a bit of that in the New Testament too. Nobody can look on God with the naked eye and feel that he's seen everything. The sheer splendor and the glory and the, the, the effusions of meaning and, and nuance, well, it's too much for a human mind or life to comprehend. But we see what we can cope with of God in Christ. And that's good enough for me. Jesus is the one I look to. His life, his teaching, his example, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. There's a program that shows a radical reinterpretation of life itself that rids our explanations of life as if it were determined by the notions of, well, Darwinism, inevitability, Calvinism, or any of those things that restrict the human spirit, we can live for others as Christ did and find that our ultimate fulfillment lies in that very fact. Living for ourselves because of some kind of law of the jungle or the superiority of the strongest um, or to put down others and marginalize them, us at the expense of others. That's just ludicrous because it will end with all of us killing each other as Cain and Abel discovered. No, I believe that Jesus shows us a different way to live. And it's made sense for me over the entire span of my adult life. It's Jesus I respond to. Jesus I love. Jesus, whose orders, commandments I obey. Jesus, whom I worship and adore. And it's in him that I find my role model, my mentor, my guru, my companion, call it what you will. It's from the story of his courage, from the fact of his defeat even of death, that I find hope and that light floods into my soul. And so the unique selling point, so the focal point of Christian faith is not some abstruse intellectual formula, 2,000 years old, that was the best effort then to get a comprehensible understanding of the problem before them, but something that makes sense to us now enables us to live our daily lives now, out there where people ask us for explanations. Jesus is the one. It's in him, as I said, that I see as much of God as I can bear. And that gives me comfort and assurance and ultimate purpose. And it's from his spirit that I feel inspired and strengthened consoled and enabled, the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not the third person of the Trinity, but the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is as scriptural, incidentally, as anything in the creed. So I believe in Christ, in whom I feel I can relate to God, and from whom I can know myself to be empowered 
for my daily life. It's June the 11th today, June the 11th, in the village in South Wales that I come from, was Pembrey Fair Day. And all kinds of goings on went in the fair field at Pembrey, let me tell you, that it wouldn't be appropriate for a successor of Mr. Wesley to tell you about. Pembrey Fair, why do I mention it then? Because my dear old grandfather, you know, I was only 10 when my grandfather died. But it's astonishing how much I remember of that grandfather of mine. Don't dig your potatoes up, he said, until Pembrey Fair. And on the 11th of June, he would turn the ground over and we'd have our first potatoes from his little plot. There you go. And let me tell you, my young friends from Nebraska, that in those days, in my youth, potatoes tasted like potatoes. <laughs> what you get now is a sham. And so my dear grandfather's simple life revolved around Things like that. June the 11th, Potato Day. I wish we could go back to a simpler age. I wish we could go back to a simpler faith. I wish we could recognize that if instead of wasting the time and effort and intellectual energy on questions to do with sexuality and this, that, and the other, we could be getting on with the business of loving the neighbor we see, because if we don't love the neighbor we see, we can never claim to love God whom we don't see. That's it. That's me for this time. I've got a few more Sundays. I shall get increasingly outrageous as I get along. <laughs> and if my salary is withheld for the month of August, I shall quite understand. God bless you all. sing our next hymn, hymn number 16, We Give Immortal Praise.
In our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession, there will be a response after an occasional silence. The response is based on the closing words of the hymn we've just sung. And after I say, where reason fails with all her power, will you respond with, may faith prevail and love adore. Where reason fails with all her power, may faith prevail and love adore. And so we come to God in prayer. God beyond us, God beside us, God within us, we come to give immortal praise and to pray for others. God beyond us, always and everywhere, creator of the world, a world of mystery and wonder, evidence of your love. We thank you for developments in science, medicine and technology. And we pray for the people who make exciting new discoveries. May they use their knowledge responsibly and find satisfaction in their work. We thank you for those who are willing to take on responsibilities in parliament, in local government, and in the community. We pray that they will do so with vision and humility, especially following the UK election. We pray today for all those who are elected, that they may seek justice, peace, and the common good. We pray for all who make their communities places of hope, support, and friendship. May we, too, take our place in working for the kingdom of God. Where reason fails with all her powers, may faith prevail and love adore. God beside us, we thank you that Jesus was born a human being and knew the joys and sorrows, anxieties and delights of everyday living. We thank you that not only was Jesus in Palestine there and then, but he still walks with us every day. When Jesus left his earthly disciples, he promised that they would not be left comfortless. So we bring our prayers for those we know are in need of comfort. For those who were injured or bereaved in recent terrorist attacks in this country, in Egypt, in Afghanistan, and in other places in the world, we pray for them. And as Jesus told us to pray also for those who would do us harm, we pray for those who have committed or may be planning to commit such atrocities. May they know true repentance and realize the love of God in their own lives. We pray for all those who are anxious and worried, those in pain, those who just do not know where to turn. And in the silence, we name those known to us. We pray for those who care for the sick and the dying and those who mourn. May they be the body of Christ in what they do and who they are. Help them and help us to live the lives of Christian hope and grace that we ought. We 
where reason fails with all her power, may faith prevail and love adore. God within us, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, active here and now, for the truth you help us seek and the love that you enable us to share in our own lives. We pray for those who find faith difficult. May they find companions on the way to help them on their journey. We pray for those who teach in schools, in Sunday schools, and in universities. May they challenge and inspire the, ch the search for knowledge and encourage their students to grow in confidence and hope. We thank you for the rich diversity of our country with its different cultures and faiths. We thank you for the church around the world we pray for the Methodist Church in Ireland, whose conference will begin this coming week. We pray for this church, Wesley's Chapel, the Mother Church of Methodism, for its regular congregation, and for visitors around the world who come to worship here. Thinking especially of the Nebraskan ambassadors and they visit us from other countries and other parts of the country who are with us today. And praying for the person or people who are sitting closest to us at the moment. We ask your continuing blessing on our ministers, Leslie. Jennifer and Brian, and on all members of the congregation. Help us to be responsive to the work of the Holy Spirit in our own lives and in the lives of others. Where reason fails with all her power, May faith prevail and love adore. We ask our prayers, spoken and unspoken, in the name of the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our friends from Nebraska will sing their final song. The storm is passing over.
steward will now wait upon you for your offering. We come to our notices for this week. Um, first, Window on Wesley's, our church magazine for the month of June, has been ready since last Sunday. Pastoral leaders, please distri distribute to your group and pastoral group members. Um, please pick up your copy from the Radnor Hall if your leader is not present today. Uh, notice for members of the Sisterhood tomorrow, uh, Monday, you are meeting at St. Clement's Church. Please come to the chapel first, and you'll be leaving chapel around 2 p.m. So please make sure that you arrive before 2 p.m. tomorrow. Um, after the service, there will be a junior church leaders meeting in upstairs in, in the Guanglin room, and the finance meeting down in the crash. So if you are members of these meetings, please please stay for your meeting. Um, on Saturday, the 17th of June, which is this coming Saturday, 
there will be a get-together for the Islington community, commemorating the first anniversary of the death of Joe Cox, MP. Um, it will be at Finsbury Park Mosque at 2 p.m. this Saturday. So please meet with Jennifer by 1.30 p.m. here at the chapel if you'd like to go. Um, May this year, we had the Circle the City event. Um, if you have made promises and commitments to sponsor the walkers, please remember to make payments. The small blue leaflets in your service sheets are for prayer requests. Please, um, if you have got any prayer requests, hand them over to one of the pastoral staff or to put them in the box at the back of the church. Refreshments are available for everyone after the service, uh, next door on your left-hand side in the Radnor Hall. Um, also, there will be tours of the premises, house, chapel, and the museum after the service in the usual way. And your guide today is Paul. Um, Paul is just standing there. Um, please meet Paul at the front of the church soon after at the end of the service as you can. Um, so he, Paul, is your passport to get into the front of the queue for tea and coffee after the service. And that will then enable you to go on your tour easily and quickly. Uh, that's all from me for now. And Leslie has got a special item to announce. Just a very quick word. It's to say that uh, Kido here um, is dressed as a Methodist minister this morning because in a very few weeks he will be one. And although um, authorities higher than I have suggested that it's inappropriate ahead of that date for him to dress as he is, I've countermanded those instructions. Um, it's very good that those of us here who've uh, been with Kido through three years of training should have the opportunity of rejoicing in what's about to happen to him. On the 2nd of July, the first Sunday in July, Kido will preach the sermon, and it will be the last occasion for him to do that here, although he'll be around working for a little while longer. So anyone who wants to come, uh, please do come. And if anybody complains, say it was Leslie Griffiths, what done it? So we sing our final hymn, hymn number 82. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder
Almighty God, to thee be endless honors done, the undivided three and the mysterious one, where reason fails with all her powers, there faith prevails and love adores. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen.